So this season, we are talking about restless. I don't know if it's a word you're familiar with, but it is certainly a word I have been familiar with a lot in my life. Some of you are like, nope, not restless, I'm tired. And some of you are hearing the word restless and you think to yourself, that's a negative word. I don't think I should feel restless. I think that's something God wouldn't want me to feel. And I wanna redeem that word for you because I actually believe that the Lord speaks to us through those nudges or those feelings. How does he get your attention? How do you ever move from one place to another or do anything differently than you did before? It's because something grows in you where you aren't satisfied anymore, where you feel like, I want more, I want something different. And that longing and that desire can be selfish. It could be a sense of, of you wanting something you don't have or discontentment about your the size of your house, or it could be about that. Or it could be a longing and a desire that is actually a very deep part of you that God put in you. A longing or desire for your life to matter and for your life to, to count. And, and I would say that there certainly is a part of us. I mean, you can see in Ecclesiastes, he talks about eternity being written into our hearts. There's something that is longing for more that is literally built into us. I want you just for a minute to not judge that feeling, to not judge the feeling of discontentment or restlessness or that desire you have for more. I want you not to judge it. I want you to turn that part of your brain off if you can for just a minute. And I want you to just feel it. I want you to feel that feeling, that longing, that desire. What do you notice about it? What is it that you really want? Can, can you say it? What is the thing beneath the thing? What is the thing that you really, really want at your core? And those of you that know God, I bet that thing is actually a good thing. That desire you have for more, it's actually for something bigger and better and, and more beautiful than the laundry you have waiting for you in the other room or the boss is toxic that you feel like you can't get away from and, and you have to keep this job. It's, it's something more than just not doing those things. <laughs> you want something. There, there's something deep in your core that we all want, that we all long for. And I believe God put in us. And I also believe, and I know this part might be the hardest to believe, that it's possible to have it. Now, I should already take away the sales pitch that I'm giving you and say that we won't have it fully till heaven. Part of what we crave is heaven. Part of what we crave is for things to be made right in the world and they're not. But that, that desire for meaning and that desire for purpose we get, we have. Those of us that know Jesus, our lives are all moving towards something. And, and it says now we see in a mirror dimly what is to come, but one day we will know fully our God and, and what he has for us and even fully ourselves and the way he's built us. I wanna start by just saying that feeling that you probably stuffed down over and over again is actually a gift. That gift of feeling restless causes us to look around and go, what else could there be? However, we live in a world that the answer to that has been very confusing. The answer to that has been to be known by the world, to do something important. We live in a day and age where if you can work a good selfie, you can have a YouTube channel or a TikTok account or possibly blow up in a, on Instagram, right? We, we live in a world where you can be known so easily that it becomes an accessible goal for all of us. We believe that that's gonna start to fill our soul, that, that what we're restless for is to not be invisible. What we're restless for is for people to see us, to be known, to do something big and important. And if we play by what we see, the world's standards, then what we will seek with that feeling, restlessness, will be different for all of us. For some of you, it might be money. For some of you, it might be fame. For some of you, it might be power. For some of you, it might be kids that are successful and don't live too far. You know, I, I don't know. Plug in the, the 
what the world would say would be meaningful to you based on your values, your personality, and what you want. But I'm going to argue that we were built by God to be a part of his story. And to be a part of his story is the most fulfilling thing you will ever do in your life. And he built you a role in it. He fashioned you in such a way. He knew you before you were born. He fashioned you in your mother's womb. He prepared good works for you to do in advance. He, he built gifts into you. He, he made you who you are with what you love and what you're good at. He, he gave you all that. He didn't just give you the color of your hair and skin. He gave you also the, the passion you have for art and music or the giftedness you have with numbers or your ability to notice what a space should look like and, and make it look that way or your ability to sweep floors and clean something so well that it's like Monica on Friends and, and you are good at that. Whatever you love, whatever you're good at, however the world may judge if it's important or not, God gave you that thing. And, and he talks about this specifically in Corinthians, and we'll get into this more later, that he made people eyes and arms and noses. And, and if any part of the body looks down on the other part, that would be silly because you need all the parts to function. So he, he designed us each to play a different part. And, and some would be great with their words. And so maybe they would end up teaching other people. And some would be great with music and maybe they would end up playing for other people. But he never meant for the hierarchy to be public and private gifts. And so I want to begin the season by just dismissing all of that crap and start by saying, you are going to be the most fulfilled doing what God planned for you to do. The most fulfilling, most joyful place to be is where God designed for you to be. There have been times that for me, those places in God's will has been invisible. It has been unappreciated. It has been even slightly outside of the things I enjoy doing, or maybe even a lot outside of the things I've enjoyed doing. And yet there's a contentedness even still in me because I'm where he's put me and I know it. <laughs> Pleasing God and being where he wants you to be, there's a security and a safety and a peace that comes with that. Now, some of you are going to go through the season and you are going to realize I am exactly where I am supposed to be. I'm in the will of God. He put me here. He has given me things I need to do. I wish they were more glamorous, but they're not. But I am exactly where I'm supposed to be. You're going to realize that. You're actually going to get great affirmation about that. You're going to go, wow, I am supposed to be a first grade teacher right now, teaching math to people that don't understand math. That will be the greatest feeling. It will actually give you peace to just explore it and to consider, am I supposed to be somewhere else? And if the answer is no, you're gonna have so much more peace and contentedness with where you are. And then there are going to be some of you that you explore it and you ask the question, am I doing what God wants me to do? Am I where God wants me to be? You're gonna ask those questions and the answer is gonna be no. And it all began with the feeling that you were restless. It all began with this hunch or this sense that, I don't know, I don't know if I am, I don't know, if I'm doing what God wants me to do, how would, you know, how would I know? I'm going to help you know how you would know. There's a mystery to this. And then there's just some really practical, awesome tools that help you know. Yay. <laughs> Yay for both. God has given me clarity around what I do well. And with that clarity, I have been able to take risks and show up places that I never would have had the confidence to do if I hadn't gotten that clarity. However, there are also times that he still pulls me into places that I'm not comfortable and that I don't feel especially good or gifted to do this thing. And yet he has helped me. And so this is not a black and white process. This is not a, you're going to do this and, and you're going to know what to do. This is a grid that you can view your life and decisions with. This is going to give you a grid that you can sift decisions you need to make through. And if you decide to do something that your gifts don't match or requires a move and your place doesn't match or whatever, then you know why. You know, okay, that would mean I would be sacrificing this thread that is really clear in my life. 
it's a tool. And then we pray that the Holy Spirit is leading you and that you are continuing to ask the questions that we talk a lot about here. God, what do you want me to know and what do you want me to do? He leads, but he also reveals things about ourselves in clear moments where we can write it down. (laughs) Hallelujah. And I hope you write a lot down from this season. So one of the things we have to lay down early on is just the inferiority we feel when we think about purpose. We think purpose has to be this thing that everyone would be impressed by and everyone would say, wow, you're really doing something important. I want you to let go of that because I promise you, in fact, what man praises on earth, God doesn't in heaven. So I, there's a lot of my life that has gotten a lot of praise and there's a lot of reality. Even this morning I was praying at, at about the season and I was like, Lord, I, I, I again just lay before you everything I do and and I want to be good with you in heaven. I don't I don't want to have been public on earth and and in heaven I find out all of that burned. And and so help me obey you in the small ways and in my real relationships. Help me obey you in my local church. Help me help me walk with you and know you. That that is the thing, right? That's that's not the extra thing. That that is the thing. And anything that people see should just be an overflow of that. And so I want to take away the mystique and the um, allure of, of it impacting a lot of people. Let's just drop it. Because honestly, that's not even in your control. Because if you are called to do something, God will bring the people around it, whatever it is, whatever you're supposed to do, however many people you're supposed to work with, whether it's your classroom at school or the size of your business or the size of your family or the size of your neighborhood, like wherever God wants you in the place that he wants you, he's going to decide like, these are the people I want it to reach and the people I want it to help. And so I think we need to let go from the very outset of size, of impact. Let's just drop it because God worked with 12 people on earth, right? Like that was his size was 12. So I think that if we can let go of that, then I think we get back to the heart of what we actually love to do and what we want to do and what God's calling us to do. Because what we can do is is stop ourselves because, well, it wouldn't reach that many people or it's not going to make a big impact or my life won't won't, um, reach as many people as so-and-so. And And then we start to compare. So let me just kill comparison. (laughs) Let's just stop it. And go, okay, you know what? We can't hear from God if we're looking side to side and trying to keep up with other people's impact. So stop. Let's lay that down from the very beginning. Another thing I want you to lay down from the very beginning is everybody's opinion. Now, I've already said, I want you to be in community and I want you to ask people, what do you think I'm good at? And we will have exercises along the way where you actually do that. But I want to begin by saying, There are opinions that people have told you about yourself that have shaped you more than God's opinion of you and even have shaped you more than your opinion of yourself. I remember feeling really cute. I mean, this is a stupid example, but I remember feeling really cute one day and I showed up. I mean, I dressed and I was like, I looked in the mirror. I was like, I look good. And then I see my, I mean, I don't say that every day, by the way, but that day I looked good. And I, and I go out with friends and somebody says, Jenny, you don't need to wear da 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 because it doesn't, uh, you need to wear this. It's better. Like those are out of date. I mean, how does that happen? How can my opinion of myself be high? And then one friend comment on one article of clothing and all of a sudden I want to go home and change and hide and like throw that thing away that I'd felt cute in a minute earlier, right? Like that's a stupid example. Some of you guys are like, I can't listen to this podcast, whatever. Y'all have had your own issues of things that have made you feel this way. But in similar form with our gifting, if, if, if you've ever felt like, you know what, I'm really good at hospitality. And then your mom was super critical of of you when you came when she came over and stayed with you if if you're a college student and you feel like you know what what I'm really good at is communicating to other people and then you do it and then somebody critiques it that really messes with us and we just need to know from the beginning we need to lay we need to recognize the times we have questioned our own gifts and we need to say okay I'm not going to listen to that but I am going to look for really godly people that love me that are for me that can say you know what I see in you it's this and this and this See, when you know a gift, let's say you do have the gift of communication. 
When you know that you have that gift, you still have to practice it. It doesn't mean that you're perfect overnight. It means that that there's something about the way you communicate God that helps people see God. You can still grow in building an outline and what that looks like and how to research and how to prepare a talk and how to deliver a talk and actually look at people in the audience and not say, um, right? That's, that's an obvious one. But everything is like that. Hospitality is like that. Whatever your gift is, it's the same thing. And so I just want you to push away the opinions of others and let's really ask God, what am I good at? And we'll give you some resources to, to help you narrow down what your gifts are. And then thirdly, I want you to get out of your mind this idea of calling. I have a friend that instead of calling, she says assignments, that, that there's not some one big special calling that you're going to live for the rest of your life other than child of God, right? That you're going to enter in and out of assignments, that there are going to be different times for you to um, focus on different parts of your life and to do different tasks and good works that God's put and prepared for you to do. And so I think we are all looking for this one big flashing light of this is what I'm meant for and this will be what the history books write about about me and y'all, it's ridiculous, okay? None of us are gonna be remembered for more than one generation. Y'all, we we don't remember our great-great-grandfather's name. I don't even remember my great-grandfather's name. I never met him. So one generation we got, even if you're famous, you got one generation before people don't care. So let's just let go of that, some big thing that you're gonna do in life and just go, what are my assignments? Where does he have me? Because what's cool about God's economy and back to the feeling that God put in us is we actually get to be a part of a story that lasts forever. That deep desire you have for your life to count, it will if you're doing the things that God has built you for. It will. And relationships will matter. People matter. They last forever. The word of God matters. It lasts forever. Your, your work matters because it shows God to people. Every other part of your life besides people and God matters because it, it shows other people God. It's Acts 17, it puts you in your place, draws your boundary lines for you, sets you in your time so that perhaps people may feel their way to God. That's why he set you there. That's why you're gonna take the job you take. That's why you're gonna be a part of the community you're a part of. That's why you're gonna be a part of the neighborhood you're a part of. You're gonna believe that, that he sets you there so that perhaps people around you may feel their way to God. We get, to, we get that purpose met, even if we're wiping breakfast tables. We get to be investing in the souls of humans that will last forever if we see it that way. So this week, we're reading chapters one and two, and we're talking about just this idea in general about restlessness and about giftedness and purpose and, and where is this headed. And, and I just want to say, as we start this, I can absolutely promise you, I can't always promise this about a season, this will encourage you. This will encourage you that what you're doing that you think is not important is eternally significant. And it also will encourage you that there are things that God planned for you in advance to do and that you matter and that your gifts are not by accident and your place and your passions and your purpose and your people are not by accident. You were set there by purpose and by design. And there are eternal, awesome things that God wants to do with you 